Hello, everyone. I'm really honored by welcoming you all to, to this event about rethinking how to bridge the gender digital divide. This is organized by the African Union and the EU. My name is Nadia Gullestrup, and I'm one of the two EU youth delegates, and I will be one of the many moderators here today. This event is intergenerational, meaning that we have had people who are young like myself uh, planning this event together with people who are only young at heart. So this is about the digital divide, and to ensure that we are all in the same place, uh, I will just briefly say that the digital divide means that not everyone has access to the same kind of digital technologies, and we currently see that women and girls do not always have the same access as men and boys. Bringing the gender digital divide is crucial when it comes to ensuring that women and girls are not left behind. Digital technology is not a luxury anymore, but something that is, is a basis for communicating with each other, engaging in online debates, and even managing your own personal economy. The African Union and the European Union have worked to find long-lasting solutions to bridge this digital divide, but we're still not there, and therefore I'm glad that we have an amazing panels and speakers who will discuss what actions that are needed to bridge the divide. To ensure that we have a fruitful discussion, I'm really happy to introduce my two co-moderators, which is Lucia Canaluti, who is the other EU youth delegate, and we will be switching and sharing this seat, so don't mind that, that we do that. And then we also have Janice Kumalu, who is the AUC youth engagement lead and sitting next to me right now. But before we get started with this exciting panel, I will give the floor to the AU ambassador, Fatima Mohammed, who will deliver the opening remarks. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you so much, and it's really such a pleasure to be uh, with you uh, here today. And let me just say happy International Women's Day. Um, it's a particular pleasure for me to join you this afternoon, and particularly, um, I am just so, so happy to see um, this room being filled with so many young people, but particularly young women, and those of us that are young at heart, as you said, um, and of course, our, the few men, the he for she's who are here to, to support us. So let's please join me in giving them a round of applause for being here with us today. <laughs> we at the uh, African Union um, are particularly pleased to organize this in partnership uh, with, with the European Union, uh, which has been a longtime partner and collaborator. And I would particularly like to recognize uh, the presence uh, of my colleague, uh, Ambassador Olaf Skouj, who is the PR to um, head of the EU delegation here in New York, and uh, is a good friend and partner with whom we collaborate on many, many issues. Um, I'd also like to re uh, recognize uh, all the brilliant women that are on the panel uh, here uh, with me uh, today, and I look forward to the um, uh, panel discussion. Um, ladies and gentlemen, this year's theme of uh, CSW 67 is a pertinent one, particularly for young people and young women in particular, as bringing the digital divide is also about bringing um, development, bridging the gap in development um, and, and um, particularly when it comes to equality and empowerment. And um, for me, when we talk about uh, equality, it is really about equity and about providing the opportunities um, for all, uh, not just, not just uh, young women, but also our young men um, that accompany us. And for the African uh, Union in particular, our youth charter is explicit um, in terms of underlining the importance of ensuring that young people get access and opportunities in technology. Article 13 of this charter in particular um, focuses on education and skills development. And it stipulates that there's a need to adopt pedagogy that incorporates the benefits of and trains young people in the use of modern information and communication technology such that youth are better prepared for the world of work. This shows that the conversation surely does not have to start at high-level meetings such as this, but rather right at the heart of where the challenges um, stem from. And this is in our schools, 
and through our educational systems and uh, different formats. Uh, for this to be truly effective and having um, me to, and for it to have meaning um, and to make a difference, I think we have to be deliberate and intentional in allocating the needed resources. This is why the same charter encourages and in, in implores, and I quote, enterprises that are located in Africa to establish partnerships with training institutions to contribute to technology transfer for the benefit of African students and researchers. The World Economic Forum also uh, supported this notion in their November 2022 report on the future of work, insisting that regulators and governments must invest in supporting the workforce to develop the necessary digital skills to thrive in future labor markets and identifying the most important um, competencies and the uh, occupations that require them. This must therefore uh, be a collective effort and it must be across the board in terms of ensuring that we are doing what is necessary to achieve these goals. Having established the importance of technology in society, we now have to ask ourselves what this means for women and girls given the gender gap in technology and innovation. And with this in mind, permit me to make the following points. First, while we do recognize the potential negative aspects of technology, we must also recognize that the positive outweighs the negative and that we can mitigate the negatives if we have the right norms, standards, and policies in place. Technology and the internet can be great enablers for women and girls, but the lack of skills and opportunities prevent many from access and opportunities. Second, Without equal access to technology and the internet, there are obstacles to equal participation in our ever more uh, digital societies. We therefore need to think about how we can be more inclusive and literally put our money where our mouth is um, uh, in order for us to effectively bridge the digital uh, gender divide. We can also do this by meeting women and girls where they are in terms of access, cultural appropriateness, literacy, and of course, infrastructure. Third point is that we cannot afford to ignore how gender technology gaps not only affects women, women whether they're young or older, but also it can negatively impact countries' potential for economic growth and development, which requires sophisticated digital skills. If governments equip girls with digital skills through prioritizing education in ICT subjects, They'll help girls thrive in economies where routine work has been automated and digital skills are prized. Technology can definitely be a powerful tool for girls to become activists and lead change on issues that affect them. Ladies and gentlemen, knowing what we know right now, I believe it's imperative that we focus on the rights of girls who are the most vulnerable to being left behind as the world around us changes. It is our responsibility to ensure that instead of being barriers, technology and the internet become enablers for girls and women. Having more role models in the tech space and highlighting women who are successful in the technology space could be a great strategy for getting girls and women excited about the digital space because when women and girls see themselves represented, they're more likely to relate, interact, and aspire towards the same goal. It is therefore important for us to further strengthen mentorship and intergenerational dialogue initiatives as there is power in learning from people who have done it before. To all the women present and to all the women representing communities where this gap is prevalent, it is too big to ignore. And we must together commit and encourage others to commit to equipping ourselves with digital skills because this can, only, this can only be the way that we can successfully harness digital literacy and related ICT skills that has the potential to promote economic and broader empowerment. Always remember that we bring so much to the table as women. We are unapologetic and being who we are we can as as aspire to trust those who are around us. Let us commit to learn from others and each other, 
learn to listen and respect our differences, learn from our experiences, and heed advice that is given to us as we try to close the digital divide. The journey of a thousand miles, as they say, begins with a single step. And for us here today, ladies and gentlemen, this is part of that step. I'm looking forward to the discussions today and wish you fruitful deliberations. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador, for your opening remarks. Um, and welcome to everyone also from my side. My name is Lucia Kraneluti. I'm one of the European Youth Delegates, and I have the great honor to be moderating this panel today uh, with Janice. Uh, first of all, happy International Women's Day to everyone in this room. It is a great, great honor to be hosting and moderating the, uh, this event, uh, particularly on this day, particularly during the CSW and in the United Nations. Um, and also a great honor to have this amazing all-female panel um, which I'm very much looking forward to listen to for the next half an hour. Um, I would now like to uh, welcome um, our first panelist, um, Mrs. Uh, Ugochi Daniels, Deputy Director General for Operations in International Organization on Migration, and also an inspiring advocate for justice, equality, and equity, who is, always, who is also named a hero of the United Nations for championing women's health needs in humanitarian emergencies. Welcome. Thank you very much, Lucia. And good afternoon, uh, dear colleagues and my esteemed panelists. It's such a great pleasure to be here, obviously coming from the UN organization that deals with all aspects of human mobility, women and girls on the move. This is what the focus of my remarks are going to be. And I make a very strong case that investing in greater digital access and closing the gender divide is not only the right thing to do, it's the smart thing to do. And why do I say this? Um, first of all, we know that the digital revolution has changed the lives of millions um, of everyone um, around the globe. Um, but when it comes to women and girls on the move, what we see is that women are 50, per, almost, are about 50% of global remittances. Global remittances in 2020 were $700 billion, which is three times more than total ODA um, to countries. And um, as I said, they're 50%. But the difference with women as compared to men is that women send a greater, remit a greater proportion of their salaries as compared to men. However, when they remit this, they use traditional methods which are more expensive and more risky than the methods used by men. And migrant women have less access to the information um, and secure telecommunication um, technology. Therefore, um, digital technologies are essential pathways to gender equality and empowerment of women and girls, which is why it's the right thing to do, but is also the smart thing to do because addressing this gap would be a critical accelerator for achieving um, sustainable development goals. We know the role remittances play in the incomes of, in, in the economies of low and middle income um, countries. Now, what are the challenges migrant women and girls face? So, w one obviously is digital exclusion and the fact that particularly for migrants remitting to countries, countries in Africa where they have a much higher rate um, of the transfer cost and they have less access to money transfer operators such as MoneyGram and Western Union, they are remitting at a much um, higher rate. And the 
ability to remit is restricted to cities. So if you are far away, if you're a migrant woman far away from a city, it's much harder for you to remit. You have to do it through a bank and women are less likely to have access to um, the banks uh, where the cost of opening a bank account is often prohibitive or they ask for deposits that many migrant women are unable to afford. So therefore, women opt for informal channels, which I said um, are at higher risk of theft and loss and um, cost more uh, to move their money. So what is it going to take to address this? Um, we've already heard about promoting online digital learning and literacy for women and girls, particularly those on the move. But for this to be a good investment, it needs to be combined with um, improved access and removal of barriers to skills training, employment, social inclusion, and protection measures. So first, promotion of online learning and digital literacy programs for women and girls. Second, um, improvement of access and removal of the barriers I just mentioned. And third, and very important, is appropriate, appropriate in terms of gender, in terms of age, and in terms of rights, law enforcement response, and targeted digital awareness raising campaigns, online safety, and self-protection education. And these are necessary measures to counter increasing criminal activities in the online space, such as online sexual exploitation, and for which we know that women and girls make up 70% of those, um, uh, those traffic, particularly through these online, online sources, and with young girls targeted twice as much as boys. So um, I'm, going to, I'm going to stop there, but hopefully have made a really good case for bridging the divide not only because it's going to advance gender equality, but it is going to unleash significant economic benefits, which will also contribute to the SDGs so that the contributions by women and girls on the move and the migrants and the remittances that they make can truly be transformative in their, in their countries of origin. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Onigochi, and I'm passing the floor to my co-moderator. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Lucia. And thank you so much to our panelists so far. This has been a robust conversation, even though it has just begun. Uh, it is my uh, pleasure to introduce Her Excellency Maria Soraya Rodriguez Ramos, who is a member of the European Parliament. And earlier, her and I had a very, very lovely conversation discussing uh, one of her books that she wrote that focuses on women's empowerment that is called Mujeres al Fente. Um, just so I can plug that for anyone who would like to also do a little bit of research. Um, I would just like to ask you one question. How important is it for women's voices to be given a platform in order to advocate for access, uh, for example, to close the digital gender gap? Over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a, a big, big pleasure to, to be here in uh, this important day in, in this event organized by the uh, African Union. And uh, last September, uh, United Nations published uh, data showing that women and girls uh, will not achieve uh, full equality with men and boys uh, for another 300 years. I think uh, uh, we all agree that we cannot wait that long. I uh, truly believe uh, that ensuring access uh, to 
equality and accessible education, including a focus on digital literacy, can be a gate changer to accelerate progress. It's a through considerable improvement has been made towards increasing access to education at the global level, and more specifically in primary education in Africa. But, uh, however, we must continue putting education higher in our political agendas to address the systemic gender gaps in our societies. Um, around the world, uh, 3.7 billion people don't have access to the internet. Half of them are women. And uh, this is a very, very uh, dramatic situation. Uh, before women and girls in uh, all parts of the world need to be connected. The women, and especially the women, the African women, they are essential contributors to the main economic activities. Uh, according to the African Develop, uh, Development Bank 2022 data, Africa has the highest percentage of women entrepreneurs in the world, with 20% of women in the process of stand, started, starting or managing a business in Sub-Saharan Africa. These women need to be connected. Uh, for this reason, it is, uh, uh, we need to accelerate our actions to close gender-based digital exclusion. This uh, uh, gender-based uh, digital exclusion has many causes, barriers to access, affordability, uh, lack of education, and skills and technological uh, literacy, and inherent gender uh, biases, stereotypes, and social cultural norms. This is, uh, um, these are the root causes of the gender-based digital exclusion. Uh, therefore, uh, an holistic approach uh, is needed we must promote uh, and develop gender responsive policies, plans, and budgets, which are informed uh, by data and evidence. Uh, in our collaboration, European, European Union and African Union, during uh, the sixth uh, year summit in last uh, February, there was the announcement of the African Union Europe investment package of at, at least 150 billion supporting both our common ambition for 2030 and the African Union's, Union's agenda 2063. This uh, important package investment uh, um, contained an important investment, a half and education. The education package is uh, more uh, important, more needed than ever. Finally, I, 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 will, I want to, to, to highlight, it is very, very important to empower our, our girls to have access to quality education, information, and technology to give them the skills to identify and fight against gender-based cyber violence. We know that women are constantly at risk of the violence in line, and uh, that most uh, women uh, who access the internet have been subjected to some form of harassment while a number of states continue to have gaps 
in their legal, legal frameworks to protect women against digital violence. This is, uh, we, we, we need to put uh, uh, measures to fight against uh, this uh, gender by cyber, cyber violence. Um, in my opinion, this is an historical moment to put in the center, in our uh, pri political priorities, the education of girls and women with the focus in digital learning. But uh, in face our uh, problems in the world, it is important to think the education uh, don't change the world, but the education changes. The women and girls will change the world in Africa and in the world. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Your Excellency, for that. And I think it's important to note that very, very special data that you gave us that comes from um, AFDB that focuses on uh, the highest percentage of women entrepreneurs are from the continent of Africa. And I think that's something to be celebrated, especially on a day such as this. Um, and thank you so much for um, discussing the need for intentionality towards visibility for these women, as well as narratives for their storytelling. Um, allow me to move on to the next uh, panelist. We have with us today Ms. Sinead Bovel, who is a youth CSO digital expert at Way. I'm hoping I'm saying Way correctly. Um, I wanted to ask you a specific question because I spent a lot of time yesterday looking through your website and I am extremely impressed with your initiative as well as um, the conversations around Let's Talk. So let's talk about Way Talks a monthly live event series that brings together different business and technology experts from across the world to educate young entrepreneurs on the future. So could you please tell us a little bit more about the success of this platform as a tool, as well as how it feeds into your overall mission? Yeah, I think when it comes to uh, technology in particular, we know that technology is much more likely to work well um, based on the data it's been trained on, which is often a reflection of who's in the room. Um, and right now, we know that those rooms are largely not reflective of, of society more broadly. Um, and so what Way does is bring together experts, um, but open the door to invite everybody to the conversations about their own futures. Um, I think we all have a right to be in those rooms, uh, and the best thing we can actually do about the future is prepare for it, but it's hard to prepare for something you're never invited to participate in. Uh, so that's what we, we do at Way, and so whether it's uh, the future of artificial intelligence going to space, the metaverse, all of these emerging areas are going to impact women, they're going to impact people of color, um, and it's critical that we get a say and, and to be a part of those rooms. And when you equip people with the tools and information they need to participate in the world around them, it gives us all a chance to shape the future we want to see. Uh, the future just doesn't happen to us, it happens with us. Uh, so that's what we do, and I think representation matters, and as a woman and a woman of color in a youth leading way, uh, I see that reflected in the demographics. Uh, more than 60% of our, our following are, are women um, and people of color. Uh, so I think representation, and it does matter, and we, we see it in the data, and we see it in the results. Thank you so much for that. I really like what you said about conversations, being invited for conversations about your own future. There's a certain level of ownership there to it, but also um, young people, young women, being able to participate in conversations that they're invited to. Um, and there's an element of choice there. And it's something that um, Her Excellency Ambassador Fatima also spoke to earlier today, that women's empowerment has to come with choice. Thank you so much for your intervention. Allow me to hand over to my partner in crime, Lucia. <laughs> Thank you for this. <laughs> Thank you for this beautiful um, nickname <laughs> to have at this panel. 
Uh, we have already touched um, on the topic of education quite a lot of times in the, in the remarks from our panelists, which is to no surprise as the education should obviously be in the forefront uh, when talking and addressing and bridging the gender digital divide. Um, and especially we should be giving emphasis on uh, STEM and VET education, especially among girls uh, where they're still we are still very much underrepresented due to stereotypes and due to other obstacles. And this is why it is my great, great honor to now um, introduce our next panelist uh, who comes from STEM education, uh, who is a STEM advocate herself and also gender equity um, advocate, um, but also has a background um, in business analytics and is currently a project manager um, at the African Export Import Bank, Africa. Afric Bank. Um, now, I have two questions for you. First one uh, would be a general one as to how can promoting uh, STEM education among women uh, can help bridge the gender digital divide, and what impact can this have on gender equality in the digital space? Um, but other than that, um, as you also uh, hold your master's in business analytics and also have uh, this private sector um, um, insight, how can governments, private sector, and civil society collaborate to promote STEM education among girls and women? Thank you for your question and thanks for having me here. Um, so about the topic on education, so um, STEM education is um, very important in these times because currently we are in the fourth industrial revolution and we are in an, we are in an age where um, a lot of the businesses that we are um, pursuing and a lot of the projects that are being um, advertised to us are all digital related. Back home where I'm from, um, you realize that there's a lot of like, um, informal businesses on Instagram. A lot of young people are running their businesses on Instagram. And um, currently there's no way, there's no way um, to kind of, for the government to reap benefits from them because it's not really being tracked. But then we realized that um, technology is like one of the drivers for, if Africa is to move forward, technology is one of the drivers that would um, allow our economic development in Africa. And um, kind of like backtracking to the topic of SMEs, and um, for the fact that, and for the fact that, um, as Soraya had mentioned, SMEs are um, led mostly by women. Um, sorry, I lost my train of thought there. So as SMEs are led by mostly women, and SMEs are the bigger driver of um, African developments, they make up maybe about 90, um, they make up about 80% of employment in Africa, and also about 40% of um, Africa's GDP. And at African Bank, where I work currently, we realize some of, um, we realize some of, um, we realize some of these, um, At Afrexin Bank, let me just get at Afrexin Bank, we realized some of these um, numbers, and then we also um, believe that really um, closing the gender gap is going to be vital since women are key drivers of innovative and inclusive um, solutions. And because of that, we actually employ a four-pronged approach to um, tackle the issues with the digital divide. And um, before that, let me also just mention that in Africa, we are not only facing a gender digital divide, but we also have a general digital divide because only about 30%, um, give or take, have access to the internet. And of these numbers, um, only about one in five women would use, the, are likely to use the internet in contrast to, sorry, only about one in seven women are likely to use the internet in contrast to one in five men. And so um, we know um, some of these, um, it's not our fault for starters, some of the factors that prevent us from accessing um, this would be that we don't have the infrastructure, we don't have the um, purchasing power because here, um, like one gigabyte of data costs more in Africa than in other parts of the world. We also don't have 
the literacy or the know-how as a large number of our population is illiterate. And um, research has also shown that there is really a clear disparity in, in the internet use, which is what I'd mentioned, about one in five women only um, likely to access the internet. And when you look in the corporate world as well, um, women make up only maybe about 30% of the STEM workforce. And this could be attributed to the fact that the STEM education, there's only a few girls who are really partaking in STEM education, and only a few young women pursue STEM um, careers. And one, it could be because of the stereotype and the stigmatization that these are typically reserved for men. But as my colleague had said in an earlier event, or in an earlier interview, technology is gender agnostic. It doesn't matter whether you're a man or woman. Everybody has, um, everybody has equal prowess to actually use technology for good. And so um, the digital divide is a problem, and when you spice it up with gender, it becomes an even bigger problem. And as a result of this digital divide, women are unable to access information quickly where it's available. They are unable to participate in digital payments, and they're essentially removed from the digital economy. But we've just come out of a pandemic where the key takeaway would have been that technology is no longer, or access to digital services is no longer a luxury. At this point, it's become like a necessity. And um, I, in, I was in Ghana when the pandemic happened, and I think we closed down for only about three weeks because it wasn't feasible for you to close down the whole economy. The tomato seller in Makola Market doesn't know that she can sell her vegetables over Instagram. She doesn't know that she can create a database of her regular customers. If she had known this, she would also want to protect herself and sit at home and continue conducting business, like um, whether there's a pandemic or not. And so it made it very difficult to really shut down the economy because, like I said before, most of the, most of the um, most of SMEs are informal. They are not formal. They don't have the skills. They, um, they are not even. They are not in the system. And. So we are um, really, um, we are employing a four-pronged approach to kind of tackling this, um, this digital divide. So we look at issues around um, finances, we look at issues around capacity building, we look at market access issues, and we look at the policy issues. And because we know that um, SMEs really make up a bunch of um, the private sector in Africa, and these are only even just the formal ones. So when you kind of include the informal ones, the numbers become bigger because the data we have is only for the formal ones. And we also know that women are more likely to be entrepreneurs or business owners than men. And so we have an, um, an SME program, an SME development program where we've conceptualized, um, where we are trying to conceptualize programs specifically tailored for women and so um, we have a financing opportun um, opportunity of financing options, and we um, allocate about 30% to 40% for women-led um, businesses just to ensure like equitable financial access. We also have capacity building programs where we, are, um, we make tailor-made tailor programs for women, we, and there we have the opportunity to teach digital skills and business plan development and other like entrepreneurship um, skills programs, right, training programs. Then um, in terms of um, ensuring equal access to markets, we have um, the Africa Trade Gateway, which will be launched in a few months. And you c it's, it's essentially a suite of trade, um, it's essentially a suite of trade platforms, but we call it a digital ecosystem. And um, we have about five or five programs there, and for a customer who, for a customer who wants to use the ATG, you'd really um, because start your starting points could be um, the ATEX, which is the Africa Trade Exchange, a B two B B two G um, platform, where we connect buyers and um, buyers and sellers. So you can search for markets, you can search for products and whatnot. And after you have found whatever you're looking for, you could also go onto the master platform, which is our customer due diligence and know your customer platform. 
and there we have verified um, businesses. And so then whatever business you find on the Atex, you can go and conduct your customer due diligence on the Manson platform. Then when you've, um, now when you know, okay, I have a potential supplier or I have a potential buyer, I have the product that I want, I've verified um, their identity and their business. You can now go onto our trader intelligence where we have uh, market information on the country once you probably want to conduct business in and the, um, the, the regulations, the country regulations, the laws, and it tells you whatever documentation that you probably need to be able to conduct trade within that country. And now when that matchmaking or when that connection is done, we help you to facilitate your payments through our Pan-African Payment and Settlement System, which has now been adopted by the AFCFTA as the payments between to trade under the AFCFTA. And for customers who probably want to um, access financing, so letter of credit, venture capital, um, debt financing or whatnot, we also have the customer online portal where they can actually go register their interest and then see whatever um, suites of finance products that we have. And as a development institution, we tackle the policy issue by leveraging on our partnerships with the um, AU government countries to make sure that policymakers, we advocate for policymakers to establish enabling environments for trade in Africa. And within, I just want to just end this to say, within this discussion around the digital gender divide, we have to also make sure that we don't bundle up women and girls as a homogeneous unit, because we differ in demographics and we differ in interest, and this would um, influence how we want to access digital services or technology. And so we should make sure that whatever initiatives we do cater for all the different um, distinct groups. Thank you. Thank you very much, sweetie, for your intervention and all the incredible, incredible work that you do. It's so great to see also a great example of good practices. We wish you all the best also in the future. Um, and now we are moving on to our final panelist, um, an amazing young woman on my left, uh, Mrs. Ms. Chida Mpimba, uh, who's the African Union Youth Envoy, um, and also the youngest senior official in the history of the African Union. Um, so I have a very, uh, that, that style appropriate question for you, um, because you have this amazing and unique opportunity uh, and the power to influence actually tomorrow's uh, policies. So how do you ensure that, you are, that these policies are empowering young girls and women um, and are help, helping potentially also bridge the gender digital divide? Thank you very much. First of all, happy Women's Day to every amazing woman who's in this room. <laughs> Indeed, the future is female and the future is now, which is why we're in this room. So I'm honored to be in this room and just to, to indicate as the youngest diplomat in the cabinet of the chairperson within the role as the African Union Youth Envoy. And now I'd just like to speak more about how my role comes into play to ensure that we bridge the digital divide. And I'll speak about this on three elements, which is to advocate, to convene, and to connect. Now, when you speak about to advocate, uh, I would our African Union ambassador to the United Nations spoke about the African Union Youth Charter. And within this charter, we're advocating for policies, policies that have to do with the rights of our youth. And in addition to this, advocating for various initiatives within the African Union. So for instance, we have the One Million by Next Level campaign, which is championed by our chairperson, and that looks into the four E's, engagement, education, employment, entrepreneurship. And this as well looks into the elements of you know, digital skills. And in regards to convening, as we're doing so today, we have an opportunity to convene young people because we do believe that if we're going to discuss issues that are pertinent to young people, we need to have them on the table and have them to come up with the solutions to build the Africa that we want, which is in relation to Agenda 2063. And lastly, to connect, because I think it's very important that we connect the way we're doing so now. Through an intergenerational dialogue, there's so much that we can learn. And in addition, through public and private sector, 
partnerships such as we can see as well in the panel and you know as we've done so today with the African Union and the European Union coming together to discuss these issues that are pertinent to women but of course I'm going to be biased as a youth envoy that are pertinent to young women too so it's very important you know, that beyond these discussions, that we continue to advocate, we continue to ensure that the policies uh, that, you know, are implemented and that are formulated are friendly towards young women. And as we look to the future, as we've also mentioned that the future is, uh, is, is female, but we also need to be cognizant that where the world is going is that the world is digital and the world is innovative. Therefore, it's very important that we look at how we can build the skills of women in terms of investing more in digital literacy. So for instance, we spoke about education earlier, and just to maybe look into just last year when we were at the Transforming Education Summit on the sidelines of the United Nations General Assembly, and and we came up with the position as young people and our declaration in terms of the education in Africa and the education that we'd like. And part of that also looked at how we're going to advocate for investments into STEM. And already we're looking at implementing this at country level and working with various partners to ensure that what came in this document and what we're advocating for in terms of policy and the frameworks can be implemented into action so that we move from less speeches and more concrete action too. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for that, Chido. And the last word you said was action, and I think that is a perfect segue because my final question to you, just to really wrap up the conversation that we're having for the panel discussion and then go into our Q&A session, is what kind of call to action do you have for us today? And I know you're very good at coming up with these on your toes, um, but for the stakeholders and duty bearers towards this action of closing the gap of the digital gender divide, what would a call of action be today that you could think that we could take forward into our work? I would say that my call to action would be more investments into execution because we constantly talk about the statistics. We have the largest demographic of young women in Africa. We have the largest demographic on this and that when it comes to you know, women um, you know, in various sectors and various issues that are pertinent to us. But really looking at when we're investing, can we invest into the execution? Can we invest into the capacity of women as well as of young women? of the youth. Okay, I'm biased again, because I keep going back to youth, but you know what I mean. And uh, finally, as well, as we speak about the digital divide, let's not forget the people in marginalized communities, the people we did not manage to have in this room. Because if we don't do so, we're going to have a differentiated gender divide where a lot of investments will go towards the urban, as well as um, you know, women with higher levels of education. But at the same time in the future, we'll still have the young women and the women from marginalized communities who we do not want to leave behind. Yeah. Thank you so much for that, Chido, and for always being ready to go. Um, I'm going to hand over back to Lucia, and she's going to take us through the Q&A session that we will have. Thank you to all the inspiring, amazing panelists. I think we'll have something to take uh, back to our countries, back home, back to our work. Um, we are now moving to the Q&A session, at which I'll give the floor back to my co-delegate. Uh, And truly really sorry about all that swapping, but you know, sharing is caring when it comes to, to these seats. So as we have so many amazing women and some men in the room, then you know, really encourage you all to, to come up with your questions and really you know, try to be short because I would love to see as many uh, get to, to ask a question. Um, so, so please raise your hand if you are up for asking a question and then really important, then you have to, to click the button. I forgot it once. Uh, so just encouraging you all to, to do better than me in that regard. And I can see that we have a first question on our second row and we will take a few questions at a time. So if there's anyone else who's up for asking a question, then please also raise your hand. I'm not sure if everybody can hear me. Yes, perfect, awesome. Hi, my name is Gwen Mediba. I'm with the Global Black Coalition as well as a foundation called Equal Chance. Um, first, allow me to thank all of you. Um, Chido, to see you here is really inspiring and as well as all these amazing uh, women, Your Excellency. Uh, my question is regarding um, digital literacy. 
uh, pertaining specifically to international African students fleeing the war in Ukraine. Um, over the last year, uh, we spent, uh, my team and I, most of last year at the borders of Ukraine rescuing um, not just Africans, but anybody that needed help to be rescued. Right now, many of our students are having issues accessing education. It's been a year, it's been very painful. Um, some of them have gone through um, trafficking, have gone through um, so much, um, and, and now they're losing their studies. These are students who are fourth, fifth year medical students, engineer students, um, people whose parents have sacrificed so much to send them abroad. Uh, three days ago, some of our students were arrested for absolutely no reason um, in Poland. When we're talking about promoting online and digital literacy and removing barriers, my question, you may not have the answer and I understand that, but for anybody here is what can we do and how can we ensure that um, all people um, are not left behind and that these students whom we're working with, who have accepted that we be their voice today, um, also continue their studies and have the support that they need. Uh, and if I may add quickly as well, as black-led organizations, it's very difficult for us to receive support. Um, over the past week, we've spoken to so many people who've sent us left and right, but we don't know where to go. So if there's even anybody here who can help us, we would appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, and please give a round of applause for the really amazing question. Thank you so much. And uh, I forgot to say, uh, who do you prefer you know, answering the, the question? Okay, amazing. We'll just take a few more and then you can, can see if you are up for answering. I can see that we have a hand over there on Fourth Road, I think. Thank you so much. Hello. My name is Nogu Zolang Lube, and I'm here from the Southern African Embrace Foundation. And I have a question around digital infrastructure. Um, what can we do or what is going to be done to meaningfully and effectively partner with the private sector to improve digital infrastructure, especially in Africa's rural communities where young girls are being left behind largely because there's, we're talking about internet, but some, there are places, you know, I come from places where we literally don't have the digital infrastructure to make a call. How are we ensuring that our rural girls are not left behind? Thank you so much for the extraordinarily short uh, answer and please give another round of applause. Wait, is that a question? Great. Uh, so we will have one last question, and then I'll revert to, to the panel for, for answering all these amazing questions. So Paul Zuniga on the first road. Hello, ladies. Happy International Women's Day. Um, first of all, there needed to be a man on the panel. <laughs> um, my question is, um, how are we incorporating men uh, this goes to all the ladies on the panel. How are we uh, planning to incorporate men and boys more to ensure that um, young girls do receive, young girls and women uh, do receive the, the digital innovation and digital technology and are included um, in the structures of all spheres of technology? Um, there's, been, there's been speaking on um, vocational training and, and, and so forth, but I think um, there's still more things to ponder on, and I think um, the ladies on the panel might, as experts, you might be t able to answer that. How do you, as women, uh, see the role of men and boys in, in furthering the, 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 um, the inclusion of, of us in to, to assist uh, more girls and women in technology? Thank you. Thank you so much, Paul Zuniga. So now I revert to, to the panel, and I can see that there are a lot of you who have been nodding uh, when, when people are asking their amazing questions. And thank you so much for sharing your stories and sharing your questions. So I saw you, uh, Chido, uh, the African Youth Envoy, nodding quite a lot. Uh, would you be up for, for answering one of the questions? 
Okay, thank you. Maybe I'll try and briefly address every question that I've been asked. I'll start off with a controversial one. And the reason I'm saying it's controversial, because it's always controversial within my role, because I represent the youth, but of course we speak a lot about young women. And the reason that we do that is because they have been left behind in the past. And we need to ensure that we empower them to be able to play catch up. But having said that, it does not mean that we do not acknowledge the men and we do not acknowledge the boys. They also have um, challenges that we need to advocate for collectively for the youth in general, but also ensure that the privilege that they've had, they can use that voice towards um, you know, us being to, able to amplify, us being able to empower more young women and more young girls as well. So that voice is welcome. Uh, I mean, we do have our he's for she's, and having you in the room shows that you're actually a he for she, because you're here and you're interested to learn more about how we can bridge that divide. And by doing so, we really acknowledge and we appreciate that because it's going to take a collective voice for us to be able to really look at the issues that we're faced with in Africa and be able to bridge the gaps. And then I'll just briefly touch on my sister. Um, thank you as well for sharing. It's always touching when you hear um, you know, the stories and you know, what you're mentioning. And uh, it's very important that you know, um, you know, through you being able to share uh, you know, the, 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 the current challenges that our fellow youth leaders are faced with, you know, we're able to collectively raise that voice because it takes us having to collectively raise our voice, stand in sol solidarity, listen, but as we do so, also ensure that it reaches our policy makers so something can be done at policy level. I'll just briefly speak within my role. Last year we held a listening tour and the purpose of that listening tour really was to ensure that we engage with young people and get to hear about the issues that they're faced with and how they fully want to be represented at the decision making table. And you having said that, definitely would love to have a conversation with you on the sidelines to see how we can ensure within this listening tours, we incorporate this, we get to listen and we get to ensure that these issues really make it to the decision making table. And um, finally, on the infrastructure, I do agree in terms of you know looking at the digital infrastructure that it has to do with public and private sector partnerships. But I also think that it also has to do with policy. At times, if we really need to ensure that um, you know this moves into action, then we need to look at the policies that are currently you know um, you know being implemented at country level, and now we can ensure that we can improve in these policies so that our you know, women in marginalized communities don't get left behind in this. Yeah. Thank you so much for the great answer. And uh, there was one last you know, question, uh, which I think that we should you know, answer, which was the part about the digital infrastructure and the role of private sector. And I can see, Maria, you have been uh, writing a lot of notes. Uh, would you be up for, for answering that part? As only one thing in relation to the infrastructure. This is a, a very important question because uh, when uh, we speak uh, about the access uh, to uh, the digital uh, uh, system, it is very important to put uh, 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 the, 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 our vision in the reality. We need the uh, uh, access uh, to big infrastructure for example, electricity, because uh, um, in sub-Saharan Africa, only 22 primary schools have electricity access. And without this infrastru infrastructure, it's impossible to think about the uh, uh, digital education or uh, learning education. But uh, we need to the other access, uh, the mobile access, uh, and uh, the smartphone, for example, is a, there is the data uh, very important to understand the digital gap, for example. Uh, uh, in, uh, in, in, in the world, approximately uh, 327 million fewer women than men have an, a smartphone and uh, uh, can access uh, the mobile internet. Um, the gender gap in internet use uh, is widening at this moment. And it's uh, because this uh, gap in the use uh, of internet uh, is increasing between men and women. And okay, uh, we need to commitment of the private sector 
these important uh, infrastructures, uh, it is impossible to achieve without a strong commitment on the private sector. Thank you. Thank you so much for the strong message. And just one last uh, panelist answering this question before we return to, to the floor. Uh, Jeanette Bowell, would you be up for you know, saying a few remarks on all the good questions? Thank you so much. I think um, kind of the common theme in, in between the question about infrastructure and somebody not getting access to education, um, and that is a resource misalignment because there is no reason in a world full of technology that somebody can't continue to pursue their studies. Um, and there's also no reason in a world full of abundant technology and infrastructure that somebody should still doesn't have access to the internet. And so I think it's really important, of course, to make space for people who don't get invited to the tables into the room uh, that they should be in uh, to have a microphone. But I think it's also important that we call to the table the people with the resources, the private sector, the institutions, the people designing the policies, and hold them accountable as well. Uh, there's more than enough resources in this world. It's a matter of who we choose uh, to allocate them to. Um, and so I think at, at this point in time, don't be afraid to, to call to the table the people that you think have the answers uh, and hold them accountable to that. Um, and then of course, the question uh, about the young men, I think policies, you know, of course there's a, a question of infrastructure and accessibility, but also within access, uh, there's sociocultural differences, um, access to, to technology, it isn't gender neutral. So the policies we design also have to target men um, that are often the ones owning the shops uh, or conducting the training uh, where multiple people need to be accessing those technologies. So I think as much as our, our policies are to bring women online, um, they're also directed at men to make space um, and, and welcome up us to the rooms. Thank you so much and, and really agree on the fact that we need to include men also in the policies, as she says, even though we, we of course need more women. So we'll just have one more person uh, answering all the good questions, which is Ms. Daniels uh, from IOM. Please take the floor. Thank you very much. So in, in the case of Ukraine, um, before the war started, Ukraine had a significant a number of migrants who were in Ukraine for education. And in fact, Ukraine, the last data was about half a billion dollars is contributed from international students. It's a bit of a complicated answer, so we would have to follow up bilaterally. But what, happens, what happened when they left Ukraine was basically based on two things, whether you were um, um, legally in Ukraine as a student and registered in the university versus if you weren't um, a legal student um, in Ukraine. My nephew was started school in Kharkiv two weeks before the, the war um, broke out, had to leave and, and is now in a university in Poland and for many other uh, well, that's my personal story, but certainly as IOM, we supported um, third country nationals who were leaving Ukraine and looking for other options for school in Europe or who um, went home. And my nephew's now in school in, um, um, in Poland. So there are options. One year later is actually quite late, but let's have a, a separate discussion to see. Um, how that can be supported. Final point on this, the diaspora played a huge role and using um, Facebook and, and social networks on where to move and how and what support was provided. So you'll see many students went to the other countries where the diaspora were there um, to, to support them. Um, so that's on um, uh, Ukraine. On the point about uh, rural infrastructure, I just came back from Somalia. And in Somalia, I went to a very remote coastal town which had never seen, had never had a visitor at my level. I went into the market, I bought potatoes, no, I bought tomatoes and bananas. Everything was done digitally. There was no, there, there's no cash transaction in the market in a remote town in Somalia. And that's due to the private sector. We're not going to get to um, a, a digital access in rural areas without the private sector. And if Somalia can do it, any other country um, uh, can do it. On the point about involving men, certainly 
Um, when we talk about male involvement, engagement of uh, men and boys, that's at the heart of almost all approaches having to do um, with gender. I think what's important to emphasize here, yes, we have to engage men and boys, but it's really the access that women need to, women and girls need to have and overcoming the soci socio-cultural um, barriers um, that, they, that they face. And the fact that men and boys are, do not appreciate, well, I need to be careful how I say this, <laughs> even though there are only five men and boys in the room. Um, it, it, it's often hard for men and boys to actually comprehend the barriers that women and girls are facing in order to do the same things that they do much more, um, much more easily. So we also count on men and boys in engaging other men and boys um, uh, when it comes to uh, gender equality, but you know, really breaking it down. When it comes down to access to information, access to services, access to um, opportunities, uh, their engagement and, uh, and support um, for this is, is critical, as we know. Thank you. Thank you so much for the... Thank you, thank you so much for the truly interesting remark and, and really agree on, on all the points. Unfortunately, we would not have time for any more interventions from the floor because time flies uh, when listening to interesting people, but I'll hand over the floor to my co-moderator, Janice, for the last speaker. Thank you so much, Nadia, and it has really been a short and sweet, succinct, but very effective conversation. Um, and now allow me, for a personal pleasure, to invite uh, Miss Madam Prudence, uh, also known as Nongululego or Himangwenya, uh, who is the Women, Gender, and Youth, Director, uh, Youth Directorate Director um, at the African Union Commission. Over to you, Madam Prudence. Thank you very much, Ms. Janice Kumalo. Um, really a pleasure to be here today and as already introduced by Ms. Janice. Um, first of all, I want, to do, I want to thank my colleague, Uriatu Danfaka, who warmed the seat for me. I don't know why she left because I'm sure she would have done a better job than what I'm about to do. So if there's an opportunity, Uriatu, you can still come and take over this uh, floor from me. The second thing I want to say is to say, I was going to say Happy Women's Day, but I'm not going to, to all the women here, but I'm not going to do it because of what you said. So I want to say Happy Women's Day to all the he for she's and all the men who are in this room, because those are also important partners in what we are doing today. <laughs> so you definitely are an influencer and you've influenced me. Now, um, I was asked to do one thing to wrap up this conversation and sort of pick up the key takeaways and sort of say that, what have I had? Um, I've been sitting here at the back. I had the opportunity to sit there and also come and sit here. So I've really had a lot of conversations today. And, and I'm going to try and summarize and, and speak a little bit about what I am hearing from where I am sitting. And I, I also agree that other people could have had other things that I did not hear, so I hope there will be an opportunity to add into that as well. The first thing that um, I think was a conversation today was around what is the problem. I think we are all agreeing that there is a divide. But what I want to also clarify is that um, in the conversations, it was very clear that this is a gender divide. It's not a women or a young woman's divide. So what it means is also, again, what the young gentleman over here said, is that we need to make sure that as we close this gap, we're closing it for our young women, but we're not leaving the boys behind. So we need to make sure that we work towards parity. So it's a gender divide. And, and, and there was also something that gives us an impetus to say, as we are speaking, we're looking at the data that is presented. And I think a speaker here said one in seven women has access to the internet, while they, in their male counterparts, one in five. 
So it is very clear that there is a problem with our women more than what it is for, 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 for men. Um, now, this has implications for a number of things, and I think those are some of the things that were coming up on the conversation. I want to pick one thing, because as the um, colleague from IOM, I think, and Akfraxim Bank and uh, Chido was speaking, something came to my mind. I didn't see the ambassador. I should have acknowledged your presence. I was looking for you, and I, and I wasn't sure whether you had left your excellency or you were still in the room. So I should have acknowledged that, um, your presence as well, as well as all stand on all existing protocol. Um, but I want to say that because of this gender divide or because of the divide that already exists, there is a challenge. And I want to pick one thing. And, and I want you to listen very carefully because I'm going to pick one thing. And as I wrap up, that is the thread that we're going to apply throughout this conversation. Financial and economic inclusion for women. This gender divide, of course, impacts women they are financial and economic inclusion. And, and I say this because somebody spoke about market access, the example of Somalia. If that woman does not have the opportunity to learn how to use that thing that you saw in Somalia that allows people to buy without exchanging cash, then it means that woman will be cut out of the market. So, so there's an issue around market access. There's a lot of things. The lady from South Africa over there, um, you know e-wallet, F&B, nobody, whatever you're doing, you need to do e-wallet. You need to do, you need to find a way to move money without actually carrying money. There's, there's also an issue around education. There's also an issue around jobs. So, so the whole thing around the gender divide could actually impact women's financial and economic inclusion. I want you to hold on to that because I'm gonna come back to it a little bit later. What is the problem that we are trying to address? We are trying to address the problem of some people, one in seven, having access to the internet or having access to some digital instruments, and whereas one in five in the other gender have access to that. And in the conversation today, there was quite a number of barriers, and I had them throughout the speakers, and even from the questions, I think the lady over there was speaking about some of the things that they've face in terms of the conversations that we're having today. But I picked up a few that I want to summarize. There's an issue around accessibility. There's an issue around affordability. There's an issue around proximity. So rethinking the digital divide requires that we address these barriers, or we come up and we're very intentional and strategic about how we then address uh, these barriers. This event in itself has been an opportunity to have robust conversations on the ever-expanding digital world where bridging the gender digital divide is crucial in ensuring that women and girls are not left behind. Now, I, I, I also want to say that we had quite a lot from the speakers here. Um, we had from Her Excellency the Ambassador, who's the um, permanent representative to the UN from AUC, um, we heard from Her Excellency Maria, a member of the European Parliament, Ms. Ugochi Daniels, uh, the AU Envoy, Youth Delegates and Civil Society, Mr. Shinad Boval and Swidi Anang of Afroxim Bank. And I think a lot of the issues that they are speaking to speaks to something that speaks about an ecosystem. It looks like, and from where I was sitting, it's not a single approach that is going to close this gap. It's an approach that is multi-sectoral. It's an approach that looks into different um, ways of, 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 of really um, dealing with the problem. Um, we also heard of the different challenges that face youth, particularly young women across the globe, when it comes to the gender digital divide. We also had some of the root causes of the digital gender divide, including the issues of access, affordability, education, like of technological literacy, and, and, and a lot of other things that we also had today. We also learned how these challenges are more pronounced for young women living in harder to reach areas such as rural settings or migrant and refugee women. I think there was a lot of conversation around um, Ukraine and what is happening there. But I think one of the things that I had that comes from that or something that I want to pull out from that is that 
It therefore says to us that as we think about solutions, as we think about the solutions to the barriers, we need to think about contextualization. Somebody spoke about rural women. Somebody spoke about 22% uh, of primary schools with um, access to electricity. What that means is that if we think of a, a, a supermarket approach, we may miss some of the women, we may miss some of the people that we're trying to target. So really it means that we need to come up with solutions that are not only robust, but that seek to address the issue from different contexts and really acknowledging that countries are at different or regions are at different contexts um, across the globe. There are four key messages that I want to summarize and say in all the shalaye, I think West Africans will hear me, or all the things that we've had today, there are four things that I had, and, and those are the key messages that I want to put to the table. And, and this is moving us to the solution space. We've had a lot of the context, we've had a lot of what the problem is and how the problem affects different people. But in terms of the solutions, these are the four things that I had. We need to build an ecosystem of efficiencies. The ecosystem is that ecosystem that speaks to the private sector, brings the private sector, brings the development sector, brings the men, brings the, the, the personal people, brings the traditional leaders, brings everybody to the table because, again, this is not a singular approach kind of a problem. The second message or the second thing that I had is that we need to embolden our stakeholders. So business as usual is not going to work, and I heard that very clearly from the various speakers. We need to approach the solution space with boldness. It also speaks to some of the issues that were raised by young people, and particularly the frustration that you raised around knocking at different doors and looking for support. It also means that we need to capacitate our young people to lead accountability and hold us accountable for the things that we say as policymakers that we want to do. And I think Chido spoke to that a little bit. The third thing that I had is that we need to test new approaches, innovation. Innovation is going to be important. So we want to close a digital divide, but only 22% of primary schools in sub-Saharan Africa have got access to electricity. So how are we going to do it? So I don't have the answers, but it clearly means that we cannot do things as usual. We cannot do business as usual. So we need to find a way to test new approaches. And the fourth message that I had is contextualization. And I'm coming back to it because, again, if we do a supermarket approach or if we do a one-size-fits-all, it might miss the girl from my village or it might miss the lady from Somalia, it may miss whoever because we are all from different contexts. I want to come back to the financial and economic inclusion as part of summarizing. I said if we do this and do this well, we should be able to close the financial and economic inclusion gap that women, and particularly young women, continue to face. Think of this all as, a, as a ladder. Every person in this world sits on a ladder. Some of them are down there. They've not even started climbing the ladder. Some of them are somewhere in one or the second rung of the ladder. Some of them are up there in the ranga. And I want us to take a moment to think about where we are. This is the ladder of financial and economic inclusion, by the way. So I want us to take a moment to think about where we are on this ladder. But to also say that this, what this conversation does is that it it helps us to do one or two things. We are thinking about everybody, even the ones that have not gotten into this ladder to say, how do we get young women into the ladder? But also, how do we keep them in the ladder? Because they need to advance in this financial and economic inclusion ladder. So once we get them on the ladder and once we keep them on the ladder, we need to do the third thing, which is the last thing, is to make sure that we, they advance along the ladder. So the question to ask ourselves is what role am I going to play to make sure that a young woman um, advances on the ladder or at least gets onto this ladder? Now, there's several things that we need to do around that, and some of those things, of, of course, include um, making sure that we have the enabling environment, we've, we're building capacity, we, we're doing quite a number of things to make sure that um, women are really moving on the ladder. We're putting systems in an enabling environment to keep them on the ladder, 
put, put them on the ladder, keep them on the ladder, and make sure that they advance on the ladder. I want to also say that um, the platform today is a reminder that we must prioritize innovation and technology. And I hope that this event has left you with a renewed sense of determination to address these challenges in your various capacities, because we are an ecosystem and we need an, an ecosystem of efficiencies. Um, I also want to end by saying, because I'm within a space of young people, something that came from Chido and that is resounding for me. Hashtag investment to execution so that we don't just talk for talking sake. We invest in execution and we remember that context is crucial. So we live with a saying from this room, investment to execution and remember context, Chidom Pemba 2023. <laughs> I want to thank the organizers, the EU office, the AU office to the UN, the AUC office of the Youth Envoy, the Directorate um, and the office of the Special Envoy on Women, Peace and Security, Afroxim Bank, and all the participants and youth delegates who have worked on bringing this work together, the cohesion to bring this event together, and I thank you very much. Thank you so much for the closing uh, sentiment, Madam Director. And now, for before we actually leave the room, we would just like to very quickly take a group photo. So if I could ask all the panelists to please um, gather at the bottom of the stairs here and everybody to get up from their seats. Thank you once again. Yeah.